Joining me now is Harvard Law Professor Emeritus Alan Dershowitz. And it's great to see you, sir. Of course, you're the author of the book, Get Trump, The Threat to Civil Liberties, Due Process, and Our Constitutional uh, Rule of Law. Your initial reaction to the charges uh, against President Trump and also uh, this issue of a mugshot. I mean, he, he put it out there on social media. Uh, he's obviously fighting back, Alan. He should. Um, in my book, Get Trump, I predicted all four of these indictments. The strategy is to get a quick trial, get him convicted <clears throat> in jurisdictions that are overwhelmingly anti-Trump, and then not worry about it being reversed on appeal, because the reversals on appeal will occur after the election. It's clearly a political ploy, especially since the district attorney now says she wants the trial within two months. It's unthinkable. Never in history has there been a trial within two months of a case as complex and difficult as this with so many defendants and so many counts. But what she wants is the mugshot. She's gotten that, the fingerprinting. She would like to get a quick conviction with a biased jury and then not worry about it being reversed on appeal. That's tomorrow's news after the election. That's just unfair. Well, what's interesting is that he's that the President Trump has taken the mug, mug shot, and now you can get a T-shirt, you can get a coffee mug, you can get all kinds of memorabilia right. with the mug shot on it. He is literally raising money and his poll numbers. Every time that he gets indicted again, his poll numbers go up. I mean, it really is amazing well, how many of his supporters, Alan, and you know this, say this is a politically motivated attack against a former president who was leading in the uh, polls. Uh, Joe Brelli's on well, set with me. He's got a question for you. Go ahead. Professor, you mentioned that, that no trial could possibly happen in two months, but the prosecution was just granted uh, a speedy trial for one of the defendants, Ken Chesborough. H how much will we be able to gleam from watching that trial unfold starting October 23rd, uh, and what will it reveal about the, the, the Trump case? Well, it will reveal the theory of the case. I don't believe the case will be able to get to trial that quickly. I think what's happening is the defendants are trying to get a severance and trying to call the bluff of the prosecution. Because what's going to happen if that trial occurs early, every other defendant will seek a trial on a different date. Remember, there are 19 defendants, which means probably 60 or so lawyers. You have to get the trial schedules of all the lawyers uh, set. And, and it's just not going to be possible. She says she wants to try them all together. You can't have your cake and eat it. You can't try them all together and at the same time try the case uh, in two months or four months or six months. This trial will be broken up into numerous, numerous sub-trials, and that will be a tremendous advantage to the defense. Now, the first motion that's going to be decided is whether or not this case can be tried in state court against people who were employees of the federal government, including Donald Trump, including uh, Mark Meadows, they are moving on Monday, or at least Meadows is on Monday, to have the trial transferred to the federal court. That will get a completely new schedule. As far as the mugshot, you know, the mug mug, we have mugs now uh, uh, with mug shots. I predicted that, and I predicted people should invest in T-shirt companies because this is going to be the most widely T-shirted mugshot in history, it was utterly unnecessary to do a mugshot. The purpose of a mugshot is to make sure the person doesn't escape anonymously. He is the most photographed person in the world today. This was just part of the political process. Now, both sides are politicizing it. Trump is using it to raise money. The other side is using it to try to win re-election. That's not what criminal justice in America is supposed to be about. It's supposed to be about one standard of justice for all. Uh, and it should not be used against people who are running against the incumbent president during the election campaign. There'd be plenty of time to try this case after the election was over, but that's not the purpose. The purpose is to get Trump, to stop him from running. It's part of the same campaign, because if he's convicted here, they're now going to move to disqualify him off the ballot on the ground that the 14th Amendment has been invoked because he's been convicted of a crime relating to... Uh, uh, revolution, rebellion, uh, etc., under the 14th Amendment. So it's all part of a political effort to try to stop him from running. It's against democracy. Look, the New York Times had a headline the other day saying, if to improve democracy, get rid of elections. And the thrust of the article is, we have to get rid of elections because Trump might get elected. And it's more important to stop Trump than it is to have elections in America, due process, equal protection, 
and the rule of law. And I'm a Democrat. I vote against Trump. I have a constitutional right to vote against him for the third time. And you have a constitutional right to vote for him or for whoever you want. But bureaucrats, prosecutors shouldn't be interfering with that right. If there's going to be trials, let them occur after the election, not on the eve of the election or not early enough to get convictions that would be reversed, but only after the election. It's a political ploy, and we should not stand for it. Well, I also have another legal question for you, because within this 41-count indictment, uh, you know, again, the racketeering, you know, the RICO, right. RICO side of this, but part of the indictment, it's noted about the outreach of some of the defendants to officials in Arizona, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. That, that, shouldn't this be a federal trial? It, it seems to me that these types of charges should be on a federal level, not necessarily by a Georgia DA. No, it should be on a federal level. This uh, was an alleged interference with a federal election. Of course, federal elections under the Constitution are state elections. But remember, I was a lawyer involved in Bush versus uh, Gore, the, the claim by uh, Al Gore that he was denied election by the butterfly ballot, by the hanging chads, by uh, closing. Uh, and, and, and those, those cases, uh, the lawyers used tactics similar to the ones alleged here. They wanted to have uh, alternate electors. They lobbied state officials. They called for selective recounts. I can just imagine a RICO charge being brought against uh, the lawyers who were involved in, in, on behalf of Al Gore, but that didn't happen. And you can't have one justice for Democrats and one justice for uh, Republicans. This RICO charge, RICO was never intended to cover election claims. RICO was intended to cover mobs, gangs, drug dealers, uh, people who have a hierarchy. In this case, many of the defendants don't even know each other. How could they be conspirators? How could they be part of the same RICO? They, they, they were strangers to each other. They all had a common goal to try to, what they believe, was straighten out an election problem. I don't believe that. I think the election was fair, but it's not my state of mind that counts. It's the state of mind of each of the defendants, and the prosecution is going to have to prove beyond reasonable doubt that every one of them, particularly Donald Trump, actually knew he had lost the election and was lying to the public about it. So far, I've seen only one lie in this case, and that is by the prosecutor, who says she wants to bring the case to trial. First, he said, she said, uh, within six months, then she said, within two months. She knows that can't happen. She knows that you can't bring 19 defendants to trial within two months or six months. She is lying to the American people, to the people of Georgia, and to the court. And that's exactly what she's charging the defendants in this case with doing. So she ought to look in the mirror herself and ask herself, why is she deceiving her constituents and the court by claiming that she could bring 19 people to trial within such a short period of time. A fair trial. Otherwise, it becomes a rush to injustice. And, and, and I, want to add, just... I want to add some new information here. Uh, Fox News is reporting that five more de co-defendants in this case have turned themselves in at Fulton County Jail overnight. Uh, four of them released. One still remains uh, there. I wanted to, to get that out to our viewers. Before you run, though, I, you, you mentioned the DA. I want to ask you about this. House Judiciary yeah. is launching a probe into her, into Fannie Willis. Uh, they're looking into her motivations for prosecuting uh, Trump. And in the letter, uh, here's what Jim Jordan wrote. It is noteworthy that just four days before the indictment, you launched a new campaign fundraising website that highlighted your investigations into President Trump. Real quick comment on that, Ellen. Checks and balances permit Congress to look into the motivations of state prosecutors. That's why we have a system of checks and balances. No one branch of government, particularly not a local state DA, should determine the outcome of an election. So let's hope that the congressional inquiry is fair and nonpartisan, but checks and balances does permit Congress to look into these matters. Alan Dershowitz, it's always great to have you on the show. Wonderful perspective from you. Thank you, sir. It's good to see you.